In the 1980s and early 1990s, Paramount Communications was a major media force, famous for blockbuster films like Top Gun, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Mission Impossible. In takeover litigation, however, Paramount was anything but Top Gun. In its role as a raider, it lost its bid to derail the merger of Time Incorporated and Warner Communications. And as a takeover target for Viacom, its effort to imitate Time's earlier success proved to be an impossible mission. So, in this tale of the two Paramount takeover cases, it was the worst of times and the worst of times. The tale starts in March of 1989, when Time Incorporated, after two years of study and negotiation, agreed to a stock-for-stock, debt-free merger with Warner Communications. One of the first reactions from the Paramount side came from Richard Snyder, the CEO of its publishing subsidiary, Simon & Schuster. Mr. Snyder wrote a letter to Time CEO Nick Nicholas that described the Time Warner merger as the greatest deal ever imaginable, resulting in a perfect company. But the fear and trembling that struck Mr. Snyder when he viewed the looming Time Warner colossus didn't paralyze Paramount. On June 7, 1989, just over two weeks before Time stockholders were scheduled to vote on the Warner deal, it announced a tender offer for Time at $175 per share, later $200, a huge premium over Time's previous share price of $126. Nine days and several meetings later, Time's board of directors approved a very different Warner deal. Time would make a cash tender offer for 51% of Warner stock. Time would acquire the remaining 49% in a merger for a combination of cash and securities. It would take on $7 to $10 billion in debt. There would be no vote of Time stockholders to approve the deal. With that, the Delaware litigation charging that Time's directors breach their fiduciary duties kicked into high gear probably with more media and investor attention than any other case in Delaware history. Here's a clip from the live coverage on CNN. The hearing should get underway in just a few minutes here on the third floor of the Delaware court. The courtroom is crammed with more than 100 Wall Street lawyers and arbitrageurs, many who had to wait in line last week just to get tickets to get in. This is Terry Keenan reporting live from the Delaware Supreme Court. Yes, you needed a ticket to see the Supreme Court oral argument in person, but it was free. And anyhow, the argument was broadcast on TV to the far corners of the earth, as Warner's chief litigator Herb Wachtel explained. Unfortunately, one of our um, founding partners, George Katz, had died reasonably, not too, not too long before um, the time went a matter. You know, totally unrelated. And um, the wife of one of her other partners insisted that, that George was a widow, go with him on a vacation. And the two of them went, uh, it was Mary Sterling, who was a great adventurer, ended up being on some ice floe up in northern Canada, looking at seals or whales or whatever it was, and spent the day out on the ice, or the morning, whatever it was. And then I'm told, came back to this little Eskimo village, the television was on, and they watched me arguing in Delaware. So, yes, the coverage was ubiquitous. Over all this frenzied attention loomed the shadow of three cases that are now legendary, but were then novel. Larry Hammermesh, who represented Time and its directors, described the contours of the shadow. But back in that time frame, 1985 to 1989, uh, it, it was like a snow globe of, of case law. There were all sorts of things swirling around, and you just didn't know how they were going to settle out. Um, so what was, what was neat about this case, and I, and I have a vague recollection of it even at the time, was uh, an awareness of how much was left to be worked out from these massively important cases that had just come within a couple of years earlier. But Unical was obviously the biggest one, at least as far as I was concerned. And it talked about uh, the, the right and 
responsibility of a board to respond to a threat to corporate interests without really defining in any kind of comprehensive way, even close to comprehensive, what a threat was. Uh, so in this case, in time, I think we all worried about, well, what's the threat here? As defendants, as, as representatives of time and its directors, we had to articulate, I think, uh, why we thought that Paramount's offer was a threat. Because after Unical, there was a respectable argument that if you're making an offer for all the shares in cash with a promise to do a prompt second step merger, there's no threat at all. Just let the stockholders decide. So where's the threat? Uh, the other thing, which frankly I thought was a lot less important or, or serious, was the question of when a company is for sale, uh, such that the board of directors is obliged to abandon its other strategies and simply look for the highest currently available price, Revlon in other words. And what did Revlon mean and when did it apply? Two other lines of case law that were swirling around at the time were uh, uh, the uh, Blasius case, 1988, Chancellor Allen's case, uh, and we're litigating in front of the same judge. And, and one of the things that always disturbed me in this case, or disturbed, gave me some concerns as, as a representative of defendants was the stockholders of time had, under the original deal with Warner, been afforded the right to vote on the deal, up or down. And that was a function of New York Stock Exchange rules because time was going to be issuing a big slug of its stock and stock exchange rules required the stockholders to vote on it. And when time recast the deal as a tender offer for Warner, that vote was no longer required by stock exchange rules. It was never required by Delaware law anyhow. But still, there was a little bit of that pulling the rug out from under the stockholders sense. And one of the issues I thought was lurking there was would, would Blasius, which was about the integrity of the stockholder franchise, be something that Chancellor Allen would come back to here? There was arguably another key decision by Chancellor Allen that might have guided the litigation. The Intergo Poison Pill case. Louis Lazarus, who represented some major time stockholders challenging the Warner deal, explains the issue. Chancellor Allen, who decided Time Warner, had decided the Interco case in 1988, just six months before. And on the subject matter of a threat, which was a major issue in the Time Warner case, in that particular case, uh, there was a request to by the bidder to have the company lift a poison pill. And uh, at the court, had, the company had not lifted the poison pill at that point, and it actually employed the poison pill to come up with an alternative to the transaction that was proposed by the bidder. But here is just to maybe set the stage for where we were and why Paramount may have thought they had a good shot here that there really wasn't a threat. Chancellor Allen said once that period of the board using the poison pill to come up with an alternative has closed and it is apparent that the board does not intend to institute a Revlon style auction or to negotiate for an increase in the unwanted offer and that it has taken such time as it required in good faith to arrange an alternative value maximizing a transaction, then, in most instances, the legitimate role of the poison pill in the context of a non-coercive offer will have been fully satisfied. The only function then left for the fill at this end stage is to preclude the shareholders from exercising a judgment about their own interests that differs from the judgment of the directors, who will have some interest in the question. What then is the threat, he says in quotes, in this instance, that might justify such a result? He goes on to conclude, uh, perhaps there is a case in which it is appropriate for a board of directors to, in effect, permanently foreclose their shareholders from accepting a non-coercive offer for their stock by utilization of the recent innovation of poison pill rights. If such a case might exist by reason of some special circumstance, special circumstance, a review of the facts here show this not to be it. The threat here when viewed with particularity, is far too mild to justify such a step in this instance. So here was a case less than a year before the Time Warner case, before the very chancellor, who had said that in that instance there was no threat that justified at least, at least the continuation of the poison pill, and that precluded the shareholders from making their own decision. It's true that Paramount's complaint sought to compel Time to eliminate its poison pill. Both Larry Hammermesh, counsel for Time, and David McBride, counsel for Paramount, viewed the poison pill issue as a sidelight, unlikely to get much traction. 
Well, for, for one thing, uh, and I'm glad you raised that, Lewis, because <coughs> you're absolutely right. That was very much in the air back in 1989, um, and, and it was the same judge we were in front of. Uh, we did, for time in this directors, we did everything we could to wave our arms and say, Your Honors, this is not a poison pill case. Um, and, and under the circumstances, what, what Paramount was most focused on, understandably, was uh, trying to head off the combination with Warner. That was the major condition in their tender offer that was the, and that's what they were trying to enjoin. Uh, it would have been a very different case if the only issue had been can time maintain a poison pill against Paramount under those circumstances? I, I remember after the decision came down, Steve Lamb, who obviously went on to become a vice chancellor but was then in private practice, asked me, why didn't you guys just challenge the rights plan? And I said, because we couldn't close our tender offer even if we got the rights plan out of the way so long as the merger agreement, which gave the company no escape, was going to uh, remain in place. The Blasius issue. The claim that Times directors improperly took away the stockholders' vote on the Warner merger gave the lawyers for Time and Warner more pause. Warner senior litigator Herb Wachtel explains how he and his partner Marty Lipton addressed the claim. So, um, what did you make of, um, I mean, the, the argument in Time Warner that, that somehow the shareholders uh, uh, had been deprived of a, the opportunity to vote. Yeah, that was tricky. That always disturbed me um, because now I'm trying to refresh my memory because I really haven't thought about this for a while. The original structure of the deal, as I recall, called for, under the stock exchange regulations, called for a vote. Do I have it right? Yes. And now you remind me, I remember I went down, or Marty and I, or somebody rather, went down to the stock exchange to try to talk them out of it, that it really wasn't necessary. And there were fairly substantial arguments why in the particular situation a vote should not be necessary. Um, and we could, could not persuade him. But then, when I guess Paramount came along with their offer, conditional as it was, delayed as it was, everything else, um, it was structured so there would be no vote. And that was, to my mind, you know, a, a flashpoint where we could run into real problems. And indeed, I got questioned very closely on that in the Supreme Court argument, as I recall. Well, you know, is this proper? You took the vote away. Why? And we had answers that the um, best answers I could come up with were along the line, well, there was so much false propaganda out there. It was not, not, we couldn't hold the road to need a cooling off period. And, and Warnock wasn't going to sit around and wait for a cooling off period. And But that was that was a tricky argument. And then the Delaware Doctrine of Independent Legal Significance, that if you do something one way and you have a vote, that doesn't mean if you do it another way, you have to have a vote. And that resonated because that is such a fundamental pre precept of Delaware corporate law, litigation law, the Doctrine of Independent Legal Significance. You don't spill over uh, from one theory to another. For such reasons, both the Court of Chancery and the Delaware Supreme Court rejected the Blasius argument. Uh, an interesting issue was, well, is it a breach of duty for the board to take steps to refashion the deal just to avoid the shareholder votes they know they're going to lose? Now, uh, people around this table could disagree about that. I mean, I can understand somebody saying, well, look, just you, if you know what your shareholders want and you know how they're going to vote, how do you refashion your deal to avoid their opportunity to do that? And that immediately brings you to the same philosophical question. You know, what is this institution of a corporation? Uh, and is it 
a town meeting. Do the shareholders own the company in that sense? That it's disloyal uh, to, to refashion the company to take legal action that you're entitled to take in order to have, in order to do a transaction which, that the board in good faith believes is a long-term beneficial transaction if you know the shareholders who currently own wouldn't approve of it? And my answer was no. And that's because the corporation is not a town meeting. It's an institution responsible, and, and the shareholders have power with respect to this institution. But it's not the same power that uh, an owner has with respect to property he or she may own. So as long as the board was acting in a good faith and informed belief that what it was doing was in the long-term best interest of the institution, it should have the power to do so. Now, one of the uh, cases that's been mentioned a, a couple of times is Blasius. Blasius was decided by um, the Court of Chancery initially, and it said there are certain defenses that are permitted under Unical, but if the primary purpose of the defense is to thwart a shareholder vote, you need a compelling justification. So one of the things we concluded in talking among ourselves was the primary purpose was not to frustrate the shareholder vote. The primary purpose was to keep the Time Warner deal together. And, you know, there were a lot of debates about how we were going to address that in the opinion. But suffice it to say, once we concluded that the primary purpose was not to frustrate the shareholder vote, and that kind of dictated where we were going with the rest of the Unical analysis. But the Unical issue was complicated. In live commentary ahead of the argument in the Delaware Supreme Court, Professor Jack Coffey of Columbia Law School identified the threshold issue under Unical. Is this issue as simple as I've made it out to be, shareholders versus management in a takeover situation? Well, I think it's a little more complicated than that, Stuart. The, the Delaware courts have said that any time a board takes a defensive action in a takeover, they will review it to determine whether or not that action was reasonable in relation to the threat. And that gets us into a big question. What's a threat? What kind of threats really count? How much can you do when you have a, a small or a medium-sized threat? And that's where Paramount and Time are going to be disputing. Paramount is saying that the chancellor effectively allows any corporate management in the country predict that its long-term value is over the takeover premium and thereby defend itself and prevent all takeovers. Time says that's much too much. We didn't, nothing like that happen and we were very reasonable. So what corporate interests did Time and its directors say that Paramount's offer threatened? One possibility that got a lot of attention was the idea that Time's asserted culture of journalistic integrity would be jeopardized. Some on the defense side felt that it was critical to invoke this threat. In Time Warner, it wasn't so much uh, the Warner side of the argument, but the, the Time side, if you will, uh, spent uh, a lot of uh, intellectual capital on the notion of there being a Time culture uh, which the uh, uh, or one of the purposes of the transaction uh, was to preserve. Uh, how, did, how did you feel that played with the court or played into uh, the wider legal issues? I thought the time culture was critical and I made my views on that known to time. For others, the importance of relying on the time culture was less compelling. Do you want to maybe pick up where, where we were on, on, on uh, the time culture? <laughs> yeah. Again, you were you were asking about whether it was real or a, a litigation construct, and uh, I think the answer was it was real. My sense was it was very real in the minds of Jerry Levin and, and the Time directors. Um, uh, and in hindsight, I, I, I kind of get it that in an era where news outlets are frequently more opinion outlets than news outlets. The idea of avoiding commercial pressure on, an, on a news organization seems like a good idea. However, uh, I want to say a couple things about how I thought about the time culture uh, issue at the time. Uh, I, I found it very difficult. Uh, on one hand, I really did to some extent believe that the directors reasonably believed that 
preserving that culture was not just something to protect journalistic integrity, but it also had a, consequ a financial consequence, a positive financial consequence to time and its stockholders, that there was some real economic value in, in keeping that culture in place. At least that's what I thought earlier, you know, early in the case. And I thought, this is a good horse to ride because, you know, if you're thinking about Unical and what's a threat here in terms of the Paramount offer, uh, the threat is to the, the time culture and whatever values it, it supports. Um, and I thought that so much that uh, I, I ran into Dave McBride on the way to some probably non-consequential oral argument or chambers conference or something, and I felt like tweaking him. So I said, Dave, what's it like to represent the Beavis and Butthead which, of course, was a Paramount property. And I was sort of feeling holier than thou because we represent time and the time culture with journalistic <laughs> integrity. And Dave shot back, because he's a pretty quick thinker. So, uh -huh. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you represent People Magazine. So, so I was duly chastened. And you should never have done that, Dave, because not only was I chastened, but it, it made me s a little more skeptical about how far and how hard to ride this time culture horse. And I remember we had internal debates about, is this, is this the biggest and best thing we've got, or should we be a little more circumspect and more emphasize the value creation aspect of it? And I was much more in the latter camp. Mr. McBride had other reasons to be skeptical about the time culture argument, focusing on Warner's CEO, Steve Ross. I'm sure time did have a culture, and I'm sure journalistic integrity was a part of that culture. But what frustrated me most about the argument on time culture was uh, the history of Steve Ross, and in particular, the fact that the time board really didn't investigate Ross. But there was a report done, there was a federal investigation uh, involving organized crime and other corruption. A number of people were convicted. And at the time, the U.S. Attorney for New York said that uh, Steve Ross was, the prime, was an unindicted co-conspirator and should have been indicted. They never did indict him. The board created a special committee to investigate this matter and several other matters that, that Ross was involved in. That investigation went on for eight years, produced a 688-page report with something like 80 exhibits, was actually the subject of a books and, record, a books and records case in Delaware Court of Chancery before the Time Warner case, and that case was before Chancellor Allen, where one of the directors at Warner was trying to get access to the report because the report wasn't even shared with the entire board. The idea that that time culture was worth preserving and, and, and paying and, and surrendering stockholder value for uh, when the person that you were going to make the CEO of the company, you hadn't really investigated their background, to me, was just infuriating. But whatever suspicions about Steve Ross that might have been raised by the 688-page Armstrong report, the dirt, if there was any, stayed buried. A truce was declared. When, when Paramount made its offer for Time, as I mentioned to you before, Time uh, hired Kroll Associates to investigate Paramount and was making accusations with respect to the integrity of Paramount's management. Uh, Paramount started to shoot back in a complaint that it filed uh, in district court in New York with respect to including raising the Armstrong report. A truce was agreed to where both sides would no longer make those kinds of attacks and therefore the argument that I'm articulating about time culture was not made to the Court of Chancery or to the Supreme Court. And I don't think either court was perhaps even aware of um, that issue. And to this day, 
Warner's counsel, Ken Forrest, ardently defends Steve Ross's importance to the Time Warner deal. In defense of Steve <laughs> Ross, I mean, uh, first of all, this does show you how difficult it is for people who are plaintiffs to crack through and make their case because they have to reach for things like what Dave just said. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the investigation he's talking about never went anywhere. Steve Ross was the founder of what was then called the modern day Warner Communications. Um, in 26 years, uh, Warner's revenue grew from 17 million to 4.2 billion under Steve Ross's stewardship. He was a revered figure. He was, um, had the most extensive relationships with people in the business like Steven Spielberg and Clint Eastwood and really major, major figures at that time. He was viewed by time, and I think Larry can tell us this because he's the time representative, as, as an enormous plus for this deal. Um, the whole idea of the deal was that looking to the future, these companies felt that they had to have an integrated media company um, that included entertainment, journalism, all these different things because that was going to be the wave of the future. And Steve Ross was viewed as a tremendous asset, not a liability as Dave would, would, um, would have it be. And um, so he, he was, I met him a few times, he was a great figure. And uh, I, I think he was, as I just put it, an asset much more than he would have been deemed a liability at that time. In any event, Time's reliance on its corporate culture ended up bolstering its case under Unical. To that point, first of all, I would commend everyone to read Chancellor Allen's injunction opinion just as a model of common law jurisprudence. On this point, he went out of his way, first of all, to recognize that directors could in good faith believe that the time culture was important um, and it doesn't necessarily reflect any bad faith that they're feathering their own nest. They just identify with the time culture and its larger role in American society. But whoever was on your side writing the affidavits for the outside independent directors, he also quotes one of the outside directors who after talking about the importance of Time's editorial freedom goes on to say, that feeling on my part coincides with the interests of the Time stockholders. The editorial integrity I value is also a tremendous source of value to the company and its stockholders. Without it, Time Magazine and the company's other magazines would lose their loyal readers and advertisers, and Time's revenues and value would suffer. The governance provisions were necessary to ensure Time writers and editorial personnel that editorial independence would continue to be respected at Time. Otherwise, the integrity and ultimately the financial viability of the institution would be threatened. So that was the record, and on that record and others said similar things, he thus concluded that even though the time culture subjectively the board viewed it as important to American society, what was most important for him was there was an insufficient basis to suppose at this juncture that such concerns have caused the directors to sacrifice or ignore their duty to seek to maximize the long-term financial returns to the corporation and the stockholders. So it was very well done. Very lawyer. understated. No, I know, but it was very deft, as you say, but also he honed in on the fact, and that's what Unical said also, you can consider the effect on other constituencies as long as you're weighing the effect of those constituencies as it affects stockholder value. And I can tell you at 4.30 in the morning, writing our briefs on this internet interco point about what's the threat, we didn't really have an answer to those points in, 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 uh, in Unical. And the Delaware Supreme Court agreed, as Justice Randy Holland explained. But what Unical said is, is what's on the board here, and that is that you can consider other constituencies. And that's still playing out today. So you have fiduciary duties to the stockholders and the corporation, but if you're on the Unical side of the line, you can consider other constituencies. And your question is, you know, how far you, can you go? And I, I don't think there is a, a test on how far you can go. But it's a proper consideration that doesn't, uh, that's consistent with your fiduciary duties. So I, I think that, you know, if we look at considering other constituencies and make an analogy to um, philanthropy, 
uh, when you're giving things away, uh, you're giving things away and shareholders could say, well, you're giving away our money. And the board of directors can say, in the long run, it's going to be better for the corporation to have a well-respected brand and we're going to make more money. When you think about other constituencies, you think about employees or other stakeholders, and you can talk about paying people more money and saying a happy workforce is going to be better for the company in the long run, so we should pay them much more than the minimum wage. So you have to make a connection, um, and, and it's going to be fact-driven. But I, I think we clearly wanted to reiterate here that if you're on the Unical side of the line, there's a lot that you can take into consideration. And this is the, uh, this gets us back to the corporate culture business again, because the other constituency, as far as I was concerned, that was relevant here was the public and its interest in, in uh, uh, accurate information, accurate journalism. Uh, how far can you ride that horse? Again, uh, we felt, I particularly felt it was necessary to, to do what Justice Holland just did, which was to say there is a link between that and value to stockholders. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to measure. Uh, now, Unical lets you put a lot of things in the mix, and I don't think anything's going to be determinative, but you never know what's going to resonate with the court, so the more you can put in the mix, the better. And what weighed heavily in the mix was the fact that the Time Warner combination had been in the works long before Paramount made its bid. And the bid itself was a threat to that pre-existing, thoughtfully selected corporate strategy. Ken Forrest of Wachtel Lipton, representing Warner, elaborated. I always thought we had the upper hand in the case, Time and Warner. Yeah. And one of the reasons was, and, and this, I don't think it's really emphasized yet um, today, you know, Unical allows you to be responsive if there's a perceived threat, a board can be responsive. In this case, however, um, the plan, the response, was in existence for months before Paramount came in. And I thought that gave us tremendous credibility in advancing this business plan. This was not some um, knee-jerk response, although you know many responses are well-considered, even though they're not pre-existing. But in this case, the fact that it was in existence for all those months, the fact that um, it obviously had merit, um, obviously had merit whether one thought one was preferable or the other, um, I thought, always thought that Delaware would um, want to uphold it. Mr. Forrest's instinct proved correct, and Paramount's Unical argument met with open skepticism, first from Chancellor Allen. The fundamental question was, well, does a two public companies who have, with no conflicting interest, have decided to bring their companies together, originally in a stock-for-stock -stock merger, uh, and then, which requires a shareholder vote, uh, and then before they uh, can execute this strategy, a hostile third party makes an all-cash offer, should the, those companies uh, be required to step away from their strategic alliance in order to give the shareholders a one-time opportunity to get a lot of cash? I mean, it was a very large premium. Uh, over the price. And by this moment, those shareholders are to a large extent uh, arbitrageurs, short-term investors. So there is no question that if at this moment you say, okay, let's ask the shareholders, they own the company, what do they want? They would have said, we want the money, no question. So what is the law required? And this immediately brings you to a philosophical question. 
you know, what is this corporation for? What is it? And who gets to say? Uh, and the idea that the shareholders are owners and they always get to say is a simplistic understanding of the law. That, that is not the law. A corporation is, uh, as I may have said in that case, a Republican form of government. Not, it's not a town meeting. The shareholders don't get to have a, have a say every time they want to have a say. And so once you believe that, then it's pretty easy to take the Unical test and say, is this reasonable in relationship to something? You know, because these words, reasonable in relationship to threat, you know, it, they're not, they don't apply themselves. They, ha they are driven by some conception of economic and moral utility. And so what was driving the decision in the Time Warner case with, on the Unical side was the vision that I just expressed about what the institution is about. In the Delaware Supreme Court, Justice Andrew G.T. Moore's questioning of Paramount's lawyer Mel Cantor was even more pointed on the subject. Drawing on the letter from Mr. Snyder to Mr. Nicholas, lauding the Time Warner deal. I don't think you answered my question I about, you, about Mr. Snyder's letter of March 9, 1989, when he views it as uh, the greatest deal ever imaginable. Your Honor, first of all, I think, as Your Honor read the entire letter, it is a bit puckish, a bit tongue-in-cheek. But in any event, we do not question that Time Warner is a good deal. We don't question that. What well, then don't you lose? No, Your Honor, I don't believe we lose. Because what we do, you can have a good deal, and you can have a better deal. And but if the, if the but if we go back to the concept that we're analyzing this under Unical, and right. you've indicated Time and Warner is a good business arrangement, and your argument is Paramount may be better, and we take the principle that to a certain extent the board is recognized as someone who can be the intermediary between the stockholders and someone that wants to present another proposal, if we're really down to two business choices, uh, why doesn't the board get the benefit of the business judgment rule here? There was one possible answer to Justice Holland's question that we still haven't explored. What if time were essentially up for sale, and its directors were therefore obligated to seek out and accept the deal that got the time stockholders the greatest current value for their shares? In other words, what if Revlon applied? Larry, on, on our side, I mean, I know the shareholder plaintiffs were making an argument that Revlon was triggered because now a majority of the stock after the original deal would be in the hands of, uh, of Warner stockholders. And so that was a change of control. There should have been a control premium. You're, in, you're now in Revlon mode. Um, we didn't think that was going to be a very successful argument, so while we made it, we didn't emphasize it. But the court gave us credit for a more subtle, although rejected, argument, and that was that that original transaction was going to result by design in a company that was so big and so massive, as a practical matter, there could not be anybody who could ever uh, take over the combined entity. Our argument was this company, it would take $30 billion, because that was going to be the combined value of the new entity, and so who was going to come around in the foreseeable future? As a practical matter, if we don't get a control premium now, you're depriving it of the, the time stockholders of that forever. Not a bad theory, but one that crashed head first into testimony by Paramount CEO Martin Davis that Paramount might make a bid even for the combined Time Warner. You had the great deposition question where Martin Davis said, maybe we'll bid for the combined entity. So the idea that, this, that as a factual matter, somebody once said there's nothing worse than a theory de destroyed by a fact. And as a factual matter, there was a record that, you know, even Paramount might potentially bid for the combined entity. And there was the RJR Nabisco case that I think was a $10 billion transaction yeah. at the time. Um, so that, that, that undercut... Um, that, that argument. The Revlon argument certainly didn't fly with Chancellor Allen. On the Revlon, I said, well, this, there's a Revlon case here, and the question is, are, is time selling itself in this transaction? Or, more correctly, is there a change in control 
which triggers Revlon. Revlon meant what? Revlon meant that instead of having whatever time frame the board wanted to maximize future value, they had to value, maximize value now. So if that's what Revlon meant, did this transaction require them to maximize value now? If they maximize value now, that means have to go for the cash bid, which was clearly a lot more money. And what Time said, and I think it was, it was later affirmed, but I, I, I think it was obviously true, that there was no change in control over time, or Warner in that case, because there was no controlling shareholder in either company. Control was out in the market. And that after this transaction, all the same shareholders would have stock in the market. So it was not a change in control. Uh, and so that case helped to define a change in control. As a, 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 a corollary of that is that a stock-for-stock -stock merger is never a change in control, unless there's a controlling shareholder in the company. The Revlon argument didn't fly in the Delaware Supreme Court either, but the Supreme Court decided to reject it for different reasons. Now, the chancellor concluded Revlon wasn't triggered because there was no change of control. And the sentence that Dave glossed over and everybody omitted that got us <laughs> later to Paramount and QVC is the Delaware Supreme Court said, and the chancellor was correct. Revlon doesn't apply because there was no change of control. Then we say, but we're not going to decide, decide it on that basis. We're deciding it on the basis that a breakup was not inevitable. Now, and we can talk about the reasons we wanted to say that rather than change of control, but we definitely said we agreed. Revlon didn't apply because there was not a change of control but we wanted to decide it differently. We'll see later on how that different reasoning played out in Paramount's run-in four years later with QVC. For Time and Warner, the defeat of Paramount's lawsuit enabled the birth of what became a media colossus, just as Mr. Snyder's letter predicted. But if Paramount's bid was genuine and not just an illusory attempt to derail the Time Warner combination, one can see why market professionals were not happy losing out on $200 per share in cash. I came up here to New York and I, I was attending some event and uh, a conference or something. And, and, the, and the guy who was the head of M&A at Goldman Sachs at the time, who I knew a bit, but not much, uh, was up on the podium. And he used the Time Warner opinion as an example of how courts can get things wrong. And he was, and, and he used graphs of the stock price to show how it went up and how it went down and so forth. And he's uh, perfectly right according to his, his paradigm, his market paradigm. Uh, but I don't think Time Warner was a mistake. I think it was the right thing, although the arbitrageurs lost money. Uh, they would have made more on the Paramount transaction, but it's just a different paradigm. And if the question is what leads to long-term social benefit, well, we can argue about, about that. I would say that the approach of the law, legal system is probably Fine. Perhaps Paramount could be forgiven for not sharing that sanguine view of the legal system. To see why, let's look at the 1993 battle between QVC and Viacom to combine with Paramount. Dave McBride of Young, Conway, Stargate and Taylor, who represented QVC, and Charles Richards of Richards, Leighton and Finger, who represented Paramount, give us some of the background of that battle. Well, is it, it seems from the briefing and from the, from, especially from the briefing, that Paramount in, the, in this action, in the QVC action, was attempting to follow the Time Warner script, if you will, um, in effectuating this transaction, uh, that it was relying upon the decision in Time Warner in some fashion in terms of, of 
structuring the Viacom Paramount transaction. Is that I think that's that what they thought they were doing, yes. And from that comment, what they thought they were doing, I, I was going to ask you that, that there seemed to me to be two aspects to time of the Time Warner decision. One was that, that Time and Warner were undertaking this strategic business transaction and that Time and Warner didn't need to upset their strategic business plan in order to even consider, much less facilitate, Paramount's offer. And the other was that the Time Warner transaction originally started off as a merger and then switched from a, a tender offer by Time for Warner, which changed the dynamic vis-a-vis -vis Paramount. It seemed like a lot of effort was made in the litigation and before the litigation to, to convey that Viacom and uh, Paramount were also pursuing a long-term strategic business plan that ought to trump uh, QVC's offer. Is that a fair? Yeah, that's certainly uh, what Paramount uh, tried to demonstrate. And some on the Paramount side, including Mike Chapiga of the Simpson Thatcher firm in New York, suggested that the Time Warner case basically immunized Paramount's decision to merge with QVC. We were involved in QVC, and there, I got two significant calls in the course of that representation. The first was from Mike Chapika, who I worked with on Time Warner. And Mike called and said, I see you guys are, file, had file, we had filed suit by that point. He says, all I can say is I can't lose both sides of the same issue. But not everyone even on the Paramount side, was convinced that the two deals were a perfect match. For one thing, the key players, Paramount's Martin Davis, Viacom's Sumner Redstone, and QVC's Barry Diller, were distinctive in important ways. But there were other elements that really distinguished uh, their factual background. Uh, there were the personalities involved here, uh, Martin Davis and, uh, and Barry Diller and... Uh, yeah. Uh, Sumner Redstone, and, and uh, you know, Martin Davis made it so clear that uh, as part of the strategic uh, combination, if you will, the most important thing, uh, as far as he was concerned, was that he be the chief executive. Well, you know, that, that ra raises some questions as to the entire fairness or whether you're yeah. really looking after the shareholders or whether price is very important to you. And... Uh, They've been fooling around with Viacom for, for three years, really. So was it, was it Barry Diller who, who, who said, oh, I'm not coming after you, uh, that, that really triggered Martin Davis to say, yeah. hey, this strategic combination looks pretty good? Yeah. Uh, certainly that, that question is raised. Uh -huh. and, and then uh, who was it? Was it, uh, was it uh, Bob Greenhill or one of the investment bankers? told Martin Davis, Barry Diller is coming after you. So there was that kind of motivation uh, or background that really didn't exist in the, in the Time Warner case, which I think, uh, uh, I don't say it was outcome determinative, but I think it cast a pall over the proceedings when they were trying to talk about entire fairness and the efforts they made. And I could go into yeah. other things that they did or didn't do. Well, I was going to ask, so you're, you, you think that perhaps, uh, and this from our side uh, was an argument QVC made, that uh, uh, Paramount wasn't really that interested in a combination with Viacom, that there had been earlier talks and offers made that were rejected, but once uh, Paramount thought that QVC might be coming after it, Viacom looked like a better partner. Um, it, was that, is that a fair possibility? Well, when you talk about Paramount, you know, you're, you're talking about a corporation. And, uh, and really, a corporation is made up of individuals. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about Martin Davis's, uh, yeah. what was moving him forward. Uh, that's not necessarily the same thing that was motivating the directors, especially the outside yeah. directors. And uh, so I'm not uh, really challenging the bona fides or good faith of, of outside directors as to what they thought was going on. Uh, but 
you certainly are a little bit uh, suspicious, at least from reading this record, of uh, and hearing the kind of guy that Martin Davis was mm -hmm. uh, about about his motivation and 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 what really got it started up again. I don't remember myself now. Uh, did Davis and Diller have a, an adverse relationship in the past? Oh yeah, they hated each other. Yeah, I, th I thought that was the case. <laughs> in addition, in the debate about the importance of Sumner Redstone's position as controlling stockholder of QVC, the strength of his personality was a factor. And one of the big player personalities in this particular matter was, of course, Sumner Redstone. And I can remember I, I, I remembered reading something, one of our briefs, that talked about the story of Sumner Redstone was in a hotel and there was a fire and he hood, uh, stu, uh, held on to the ledge of a window by one hand until he could be rescued from the burning building. This is a guy that, that doesn't give tough. up very easily. <laughs> and sure enough, he didn't give up very easily. But that sort of goes back to the, the Martin Davis. I, I, I can't imagine Martin Davis thought that, as between he, uh, between himself and Sumner Redstone, that Martin was going to end up being the CEO over Redstone. Sumner must have offered Martin Davis some sort of a contract. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, but of course, contracts are just contracts. You can breach the contract, and then you pay damages. Right. So uh, I don't know whether Martin Davis had a relationship with Sumner, so he thought, I'm really going to be chief executive yeah. for a number of years here, you know, I've signed a five-year contract, or whether he thought, look, I've got this contract, I've named the chief executive for my pride and my face, if a year or two later down the road Sumner lets me go, okay, but I'll get the damages, you know, so I, I don't know what he thought, and I don't know what Sumner thought, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But from the outside, as a lawyer, yes. I was quite skeptical that Martin Davis would have a long career at, uh, <laughs> at the combination. But, yeah. but I, I don't know. Well, I think we were skeptical on our side that, that he would have uh, a, a long career there as well. Another weak spot in the Viacom Paramount deal was the suggestion that the Viacom deal was actually worse than it looked because Viacom stock, which was part of the deal price, had been inflated by stock purchases by Sumner Redstone. That triggers another recollection of mine that all the things that they did here, I think, raised suspicion in the Supreme Court's mind and the mm -hmm. Chancery Court's mind. I mean, maybe they weren't the reasons that were decided, but, but once again, uh, they were taking this stock but it's, it was pretty apparent to me, maybe it never was a proven fact in the case, that Redstone had manipulated the price of his stock by <laughs> buying in. And, and, the, and uh, Paramount hadn't said, well, 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 therefore we have to have a collar uh, around this right. so that it doesn't drop. And, and so there, there's a half a dozen of these, what I'll call details, but they're really not details, where it just didn't seem that the, the Paramount was very skillfully looking out for the interests of its shareholders, let's put it that way. Well, in fact, I wrote that part of the factual argument in QVC's reply brief, uh, focusing on the fact that an offer had been made by uh, Viacom for Paramount in July that had been rejected. And then Redstone went in the market and started buying up Paramount stock, and the and the price of the stock rose, so that the it deal didn't just rise; it almost doubled. It yeah, went from the it 30s was, into the 50s. Yeah, and so the deal that was actually done was less cash than the deal that Paramount's board had rejected as inadequate back in July and only had a, a value, a market value, in excess of the old offer because of the inflated price of the stock. As it turned out, though, these suspicions and factual uncertainties didn't seem to matter. What was important was the indisputable fact that the Paramount board didn't ask a lot of questions that would have come up if they had believed that they were managing a bidding contest between QVC and Viacom.
I had a very, very strong view of how QVC should be litigated. Um, and I called it the dog that didn't bark. Um, I looked at the minutes, such as they were, which they were very skeletal, of the QVC, of the Paramount Board. And, and um, they were very skeletal. And I basically approached the case. I think you and I talked about it, because uh, we must have, of course, we talked about it. And I sat back and said, if I had been running that board meeting, how would the board meeting have been conducted? What should the board have known? And there were all sorts of facts that the board should have been aware of. It was that um, between the time they turned down a previous offer uh, and the time of the offer they were accepting, uh, Redstone had been buying up shares of stock, so it made the, the new offer look like a great offer and actually was inferior to the previous offer. Uh, that they should know that, that they should know about the lockup, that they should know about the no shop clause, and, and so on, so on, and so on. It might be like five or six critical things, at least, that, that a reasonable board should know uh, before it would decide to accept the uh, Redstone offer. Oh, there was options, I mean, a whole, whole, whole bunch of things. and. I insisted that I would take the first deposition of a board member, and that hopefully that would be the prototype of everybody else who was taking uh, the continuing depositions. And my whole sequence of questions was the first guy, uh, well, at the board meeting, were you told X? Did anybody ask? No. No, I don't remember that. And on and on and on, just a pattern. And that, and then a perfectly continual pattern continued on, on every other director. Because in fact, they hadn't been advised and nobody had asked. And that became the brief, particularly I think in the Supreme Court. Uh, it, was, it was the dog that didn't bark. We, we, had, no, we had no affirmative facts. <laughs> we, had no, we, had no, oh, we, we had the facts of, uh, when a raise came or when, but what did we have to show that the board didn't act reasonably? And we had no affirmative evidence that didn't act easily. It was only this, what we created. You should have been told this, and you weren't, and nobody bothered to ask. And that was powerful, 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 uh, I think, in, uh, in, winning, in winning that case in the Supreme Court. These facts also powerfully affected Vice Chancellor Jacobs, who decided the case in the Court of Chancery. One of the unusual things about this case was that uh, Wachta Lipton, which had a, a long track record of representing target companies, is now on the side of the bidder. Did that come up in any way? Did that manifest itself in the case in any? Not in any uh, explicit way, but everybody knew. Uh, that this is a new departure for uh, Wachtel. Uh, and it, uh, they sent in their a very senior warrior, uh, Herbert Wachtel, you know, who litigated the case, litigated the case uh, in both courts. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think we'll, uh, one of his partners uh, once described him as a force of nature. But, uh, you know, like Ned Carpenter, to me, he was one of the great uh, advocates uh, and someone uh, you know that was able to uh, uh, assimilate a, uh, a conglomeration of, of uh, very complicated facts and turn it into a simple story and uh, and be consistent with any you know any development that happened after that so uh, and uh, as you know, the, the, you know, they ended up winning that preliminary injunction case and that it got affirmed. Uh, again, the problem was not really with the facts. I mean, the facts were pretty clear. 
but the law was not. So what was unclear about the law and why was that important? The irony here, of course, as anybody who's looked at this case knows, is that the defendant uh, defending the transaction against the hostile bidder is Paramount, which had just a few years before been itself a bidder in a case against time with respect to the merger with Warner. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the lawyers for Paramount and Viacom, which was the original merger partner, uh, did their best to wrap themselves in the mantle of the court's approval of the Time Warner transaction just three or four years earlier. What kind of issues did that present for you? Well, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, this, this is a transaction which if the law, if Revlon applied, if it was a, Re, a so-called Revlon transaction, then it would have to be enjoined uh, because there was a billion, almost a billion dollar difference between the deal that, the, that was uh, heading toward a closing to a, you know, to a- With Viacom, yeah. With Viacom, and the deal that uh, was being offered by QVC. Paul Rowe of Wachta Lipton offered one explanation for the failure of Paramount's board to pursue the highest available deal price. They misunderstood the law that governed their actions. So <clears throat> one of the, uh, the thoughts that uh, some observers have had about what was going on uh, inside the Paramount boardroom was that they were in effect operating under a mistake of law. They believed that they had no legal responsibility to deal, or their advisors believed they had no legal responsibility to answer any of the questions that you refer to or to provide the board with information because in their mind they were operating frankly under uh, a an unreconstructed Time Warner uh, approach to life where if you're doing a strategic deal you don't have to pay attention to somebody who comes along and wants to, uh, uh, to, to buy. So where did the Paramount director's approach to life come from? After all, everyone agreed that Sumner Redstone would be the controlling stockholder if Paramount merged with Viacom. And Chancellor Allen in the Time case said that a change in corporate control does place the board in a situation in which it is charged with the single duty to maximize current share value. As Justice Randy Holland noted earlier, the Delaware Supreme Court's opinion in the Time case found that Chancellor Allen's ruling was correct. So what was unclear? Former Vice Chancellor Jacobs who found the law unclear on this point when he ruled for QVC, explains. So the issue was, uh, one of the issues was, uh, is this a Revlon transaction? Um, that, you know, what was, that was a problematic issue because the Supreme Court uh, went in two completely, op what appeared to be two completely opposite directions as you intimated. In 1988, they decided a, a takeover case called McMillan. And uh, in the, their opinion, uh, and, and, and all of the, you know, the, 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 it, McMillan was 1998, I think, or 88, 89 was uh, Barkan. And in both of those cases, there, the question was, uh, was Revlon applicable and the Supreme Court said Revlon is applicable in three situations. First, if the company puts itself up for sale. Secondly, if the company uh, um, commits to what is effectively the same thing uh, called a bust-up transaction, that is, they sell it off in pieces uh, rather than as a complete integrated company. Or thirdly, if there's a change of control, and that was the doctrine, the law in 1988 and 1989. Then we get to Time Warner. And Time Warner, uh, the, you know, this, the, the deal was cast as a merger of equals. So that there would be no, uh, you know, controlling shareholder 
uh, one of the arguments was that uh, this was a Revlon deal, and therefore, uh, you know, the uh, Time Warner directors were breaching their fiduciary duty, you know, by not abandoning the deal with uh, Warner, uh, and uh, by not accepting with open arms uh, Paramount. So, in that particular case, the Chancellor citing uh, I mean, he said, no, well, this is not a Revlon deal. There's no change of control, which there wasn't. Uh, there's no, uh, they, the company didn't put itself up for sale, and they're not, you know, they're not uh, busting the company up. You know, this is essentially a third party merger. It's part of a long standing, the culmination of a long standing business plan. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no breach of fiduciary duty. Goes up to the Supreme Court. And uh, in dictum, because the Supreme Court didn't really need to do it, but they uh, held, uh, when they, in talking about Revlon, that there are, without excluding other possibilities, two, two circumstances, not three, where uh, Revlon is triggered. The first is where the company is put up for sale. The second is where the company is committed to a breakup or bust-up transaction. It doesn't mention change of control, period. Now, you can read that uh, at least two ways. One is that they were, without explicitly holding it, eliminating change of control as a trigger at Revlon. Or secondly, uh, uh, that it's just, it was just a poor opinion writing, uh, and they weren't intending to do that. Uh, that turned out to be what QVC was all about. That is, the, the, it turned out to be a billion dollar bet on the part of uh, Viacom, uh, uh, that uh, that that the Supreme Court really was intending to strike a change of control as a trigger for Revlon, and therefore uh, the change of control transaction in Viacom QV, in the QVC Viacom Paramount case uh, didn't matter. It didn't matter. It was not a Revlon deal. Gil Sparks of Morris Nichols Arston Tunnel, who represented Viacom, underscored the problem of interpreting the Delaware Supreme Court's opinion in time. Instead of saying three circumstances, they, they, they went out of the way in the opinion to say two circumstances. And, and change of control wasn't one of them. And change of control wasn't one of them. And clearly this, the, the, this was the, 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 the test of whether either on October or September 12 or, or October 24, you had what we have come to call Revlon obligations or Revlon duties or not, depended on whether or not there was a change of control within the meaning of Revlon and all the cases that followed it. And, uh, and by arguably, and I say that because that's what we're talking about, that's what we were yeah. arguing, yep. arguably, uh, the Supreme Court in time backed off that and took change of control uh, off the table. and and, and Probably that's the right time for me. To, that's where that's what we faced, yeah. and those were the, and, 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 and both Paramount and Viacom uh, made the take the table off the table argument. And then when it came to policy, they had some arguments. Our argument uh, was was basically, look, you're going to discourage bids from uh, entities like. Uh, like Viacom, who happened to have a controlling stockholder. And by the way, there's a huge equity uh, surviving component here. So maybe this is more like a stock for stock and Time Warner than it is uh, um, a, right. a pure cash out merger. Those were our policy positions. They didn't carry the day, but, but that was what we were talking about. So how did Vice Chancellor Jacobs resolve the issue of interpreting Revlon's treatment in the Time case? Simple. He punted. The problem for me was, uh, you know, which Supreme Court opinion do I uh, do I credit? You know, do I go with uh, Mil uh, Macmillan and uh, Barkan, or do I go with Time? And uh, uh, you know, I ended up. It was one of the most difficult uh, cases I've ever had. Uh, you know, ended up doing draft after draft and throwing them away uh, because there's no way. You know, I could resolve, uh, uh, you know, the, the Revlon issue directly. There was just no way to do it. Uh, and so what I ended up doing, particularly since uh, we were fastly approaching 
uh, the takedown date for the tender offer was to say that to point out the problem, uh, but state that uh, you know that it wasn't necessary to resolve whether or not this was a Revlon case, because the same result should have obtained uh, since uh, Revlon uh, Revlon really was an enhanced scrutiny case, and because of the behavior of the target company board uh, in not uh, uh, exercising due care in evaluating whether or not to jettison uh, the deal they had and go with the higher offer, but just you know basically they were in lockstep with what senior management wanted. Uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, an apparent breach of the duty of care uh, that required uh, enhanced scrutiny. And so, you know, this at least was, in, you know, a circumstance where the Revlon enhanced scrutiny and due care enhanced scrutiny coincided. And then starting, in, you know, putting Revlon to one side held that under any enhanced scrutiny, this deal just could not survive. And, then got into all the deal protection measures and the, you know, and that got affirmed. But uh, what it did, uh, the way the opinion got written, was to leave the door open for the Supreme Court to straighten out the doctrinal uh, problem, which they did. The Delaware Supreme Court's decision in QVC to clarify what triggered Revlon duties was quite deliberate. Chief Justice E. Norman Vesey, who wrote the QVC opinion, explains what he and his colleagues, Justice Horsey and more, were thinking at the time. We decided, uh, the three of us in uh, the Q QVC case, that uh, we didn't need to overrule Time Warner. We decided that ab initio, and that uh, we, we could deal with this uh, with more finesse. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Gil talks about the policy. That's one of the policy arguments that that we were we, we were wondering about was if Vice Chancellor Jacobs had done such a super job in in navigating this Court of Chancery decision, and it was just highly nuanced and very sophisticated. But we sensed that he would like to have a sweeping ruling that says change of control is Revlon end of story. Um, and so we decided as a matter of policy we needed to do that because that had to be the yeah. result. And we did, deal, we did deal with this language about uh, breakup. Mm -hmm. It's not, we said it can't be that you have to have change of control and a breakup. You could have one or the other. And here's what we said. The paramount defendant's position that both a change of control and a breakup are required must be rejected. Such a holding would, holding would unduly restrict the application of Revlon, is consistent with this court's decisions in Barkhan and Macmillan, and has no basis in policy. This pronouncement was a great step forward in clarifying Delaware law, but it came with language that briefly gave QVC's lawyers concern that the Paramount Board's strategic vision of a combination with Viacom would trump any duty to take a higher cash price offered by QVC. After the Supreme Court opinion came down, our concern was that the auction was going to be conducted like most auctions, where the board would be the auctioneer right. and make the decision as to which offer was the higher offer right. and which was the lower. And we were concerned, based on the Supreme right. Court opinion, that the Paramount Board would find the intrinsic long-term value of Paramount combined with Viacom vastly better than the intrinsic long-term value of Paramount owned by QVC. And so when the Paramount Board came out and said, we're going to conduct an auction where the, with, of competing tender offers where the stockholders are going to make the choice which is yeah. better, and whoever gets 50% or more wins, we were like, ha, huh, what a relief, because we knew the stockholders would be making the decision based on immediate value. Right. And so they did. But it was Viacom, not QVC, that ended up putting the greatest immediate value on the table. The strategic vision of a Viacom-Paramount combination, therefore, carried the day. Although, at a price about $2 billion more than what Viacom had originally agreed to pay, 
Speculation about what-ifs that might have avoided the application of Revlon didn't persuade even those on the defendant's side. The other thing to think about, we'll never know the answer, although we do know the answer, I think we do know the answer based on the clarity that we got as a result of the QVC opinion. But the original Viacom uh, proposal, if you recall, was 90% stock and 10% cash. Right. When By the time it got up to the court, it was 51% cash and 49% stock. The argument, the policy argument that there's a, a, a large continuing interest, and this should be not dealt with the same way you deal with a cash-out merger. This is a, a much closer to a, a non-Revlon transaction. That would have been much more powerful if the September yeah. 12 deal was the one that was on the table. Now, by pro right. it, would have, it would have, under the reasoning of the Supreme Court, it would have still lost. Yeah, but because it was a change of control. Change of control yeah. But it would have been, um, it would have been a, a, a lot... <laughs> It would have been a harder argument, it would have, uh, or a harder result yeah. uh, to reach. The other, the other thing that uh, passed, I know, I know you thought about it. Uh, um, I know I've thought about it since. Is I suppose there were things that could have been done uh, uh, to, if you will, mitigate the control power of Sumner Redstone uh, in the combined entity under the original agreement. Uh, Sumner Redstone or his affiliates, companies, was were going to be would, would end up being the controlling stockholder of the combined Viacom Paramount. That was built in from the beginning. Do you recall any discussion, uh, either at the beginning or during the process, of trying to put some constraints on the? on the power that Redstone would have as the controller of the combined company to try to avoid the, uh, the Revlon uh, I argument. don't recall any, any such discussion. I would have thought that by the nature of Sumner Redstone and mm -hmm. the kind of guy he was, that uh, he would not have welcomed any such suggestions. Well, I can tell you from our side, when we were structuring the argument on our side and focusing on... Redstone's control as triggering Revlon, the fact that Redstone would have control right. and there was a change of control. I was concerned that your side would respond by restructuring something, putting some constraints on Redstone um, uh, and the powers that he would have as a controlling stockholder. And I was told by more experienced attorneys, particularly at Wachtell Lipton, that knowing, just what you said, that knowing Sumner Redstone, there was no chance that there were gonna be any restraints put on Redstone and we could rely on this change of control argument um, and, not, uh, and not worry that some, something would, uh, some restrictions would be put on Redstone. In the end, the QVC case was a giant step in the clarification of Delaware corporate law and a lasting tribute to the foresight and analytical prowess of Chancellor William T. Allen. I'd like to say something about Chancellor Allen. He was a giant of the judiciary, uh, and, he, and his opinions have resonance today, uh, as always. Um, but I think the, we relied on him in the Supreme Court opinion uh, for the point that change of control triggers Revlon. And we quoted his trial decision in the time case, not the Supreme Court opinion, right. as being correct as a matter of law, which the Supreme Court did say in time. And that, that was, an, was unlocking a key in the jurisprudence that we had. So that, that opinion survived as a court of chancery opinion. And I remember talking with Chancellor Allen after that. He appreciated that very yeah, much. I'm, I'm sure he did. And, and I say the same of your QVC decision. I think uh, when you ask the question, what decisions have, have uh, 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 won the test of time, uh, uh, it has. I, I, I think the QBC decision, in one sense, was, I'm not sure there was after that, certainly it cleared up the Revlon issue, but I'm not sure after that there was another great decision that shaped the M&A market in quite the way Unical, Revlon, Time Warner, QBC did.